Before his fine film directing run began, John Glenn was very much involved in the making of the Bond films. John Glenn edited on Her Majesty's Secret Service and was the second unit director. Much of that film's unique style can be attributed to Glenn's editing. Glenn returned for The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker in the same roles, before he was promoted to director for For Your Eyes Only. For Your Eyes Only was much more grounded than any of the previous Roger Moore Bond films. As Moore's fifth Bond film, and having been Bond for eight years, it was a good opportunity to make something more akin to a traditional spy story. I certainly wouldn't call myself an expert on directing styles or anything like that, but along with cinematographer Alan Hume, For Your Eyes Only has a distinctive and classy look. For many people, For Your Eyes Only is a fan favourite, and the creative contributions from John Glenn and Alan Hume are obvious reasons why. John Glenn returned to direct for the next Bond film, Octopussy. There was the possibility of Moore being replaced. James Brolin even appeared in some screen tests. Moore ultimately stayed on due to the upcoming rival Never Say Never Again Bond film starring Sean Connery. Once again, Alan Hume returned as the cinematographer. Octopussy is excellently shot, but has a different style from For Your Eyes Only. John Glenn and Alan Hume made superb use of the Indian landscapes, and I'd say that Octopussy has much more striking imagery than For Your Eyes Only, in part because of the location. While A View to a Kill may have a rather subpar story, the look of it was rather nicely done. John Glenn and Alan Hume again returned. A View to a Kill doesn't have as great locations as Octopussy, but Glenn and Hume still make excellent use of the Californian scenery, and the scenes filmed in Pinewood Studios look fantastic too. Glenn had now directed three Bond films, each with their own distinct style. None of these films feel samey. After Moore bowed out as James Bond, John Glenn remained as director once again for a fourth Bond film. With The Living Daylights, John Glenn was now equal with Guy Hamilton with the most Bond films directed. Alan Hume did not return as cinematographer and was replaced by Alec Mills. For my money, The Living Daylights is one of the best shot Bond films in the entire series. The urban landscape of Bratislava, the Afghan desert, the snowy tundra of Austria, and anything else is excellently captured. The Living Daylights is a delight for the eyes. License to Kill marked the end of an era, although many didn't know it at the time. It was to be Timothy Dalton's last Bond film, and Albert R. Broccoli's last Bond film as producer. John Barry bowed out as composer, with The Living Daylights and most of the MI6 cast were replaced by the time Goldeneye was released, apart from Desmond Llewellyn. License to Kill does doesn't have especially good production values compared to its immediate successors and predecessors in the series. I'm not sure why this is, as the budget wasn't much lower than in previous entries. The tanker chase sequence towards the end of the film is very nicely shot. Alec Mills returned as the cinematographer again. License to Kill has a unique aesthetic in my opinion, perhaps due to a combination of the tone and the locations. Aside from some dodgy back projection, License to Kill doesn't look too bad, though the drop in production values can hardly be blamed on John Glenn and Alec Mills. John Glenn's final Bond film is unlike any of the previous four he directed. John Glenn's Bond films did have the tradition of a noise or other elements startling both Bond and the audience. Aside from that, John Glenn's five films all stand on their own, with no real theme linking them all together. It's a testament to John Glenn that he was the director behind A View to a Kill and License to Kill, totally two very different films. John Glenn directed every Bond film of the 1980s, and with five consecutive films under his belt, he also directed more Bond films than anybody else. Given how often a new Bond director is brought in nowadays, that is a record that is unlikely to be beaten. In the discussions of Bond directors, I often hear praise for Guy Hamilton, Lewis Gilbert, and Terence Young for being so instrumental during the so-called classic Bond era. John Glenn is, from what I've seen, rather underrated. John Glenn may have become the Bond producer's easy-to-contact go-to director, but that needn't be a bad thing. John Glenn was ultimately a reliable director, one that the series could always count on. Which of the John Glenn directed Bond films is your favourite? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.